Hi, welcome to this mini lecture on vitamin D and preventing osteoporosis and rickets for osteomalacia in adults. If you haven't yet watched the video on calcium homeostasis and parathyroid hormone, I recommend that you start there first. So let's first consider what life was like in the inner cities in uh, Northern Europe or the United States about a hundred years ago. These were pretty dark places where children did not get outside and play in the sunlight much. And we know that rickets was endemic during this time period. And on the right is shown pictures of children, young children who have rickets and the common bone deformities and growth retardation uh, that results. And imagine the scientific conundrum in the 1920s when it was discovered that both sunlight and cod liver oil supplements could cure and prevent rickets. That's kind of a bizarre combination of things to cure or prevent a situation. Um, I, I like this, this old image showing a little boy who's being treated for rickets with a UV radiation and showing um, on the right here, changes in his bone mineralization um, in his wrists. So we now know that vitamin D can be uh, provided both by uh, UV irradiated skin and the diet. So solar UVB irradiation can create vitamin D in the skin and we get vitamin D from fatty fishes, from um, milk, mostly milk that uh, there have been supplements of uh, vitamin D added to. It's been enriched with vitamin D. Put an X through the cheese here because most cheeses do not have added vitamin D and therefore are naturally quite low in vitamin D. So either place we get vitamin D from, it then has to be activated. And the first step is, is in the liver the, um, there's a hydroxylation reaction to make 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And this is the form that's clinically measured from uh, blood. Then uh, the kidney takes up some of this 25 hydroxy vitamin D and adds another hydroxyl group on the one position to make 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the activated form of this vitamin or now it's a hormone. So currently the rickets is found most commonly in black American children in, in very young children and children who are exclusively breastfed. So we know that the skin pigment melanin prevents sunburn, skin cancer, but it also prevents vitamin D synthesis just the way sunscreen does. There's one study in Minnesota that estimated that almost 0.2% of black children had rickets compared to about uh, tenfold fewer of the entire population. And a national study has found that 83% of children, US children with rickets were black and 96% of them were breastfed. And we'll talk about later how all breastfed infants are recommended to receive vitamin D supplements because breast milk is not a good source of vitamin D. All right, let's look in a little more detail about this mechanism of vitamin D synthesis. So vitamin D is made from dehydrocholesterol, dehydro so a metabolite of cholesterol. And the UV irradiation breaks one of the bonds in the second or B ring within the steroid backbone. And that can then isomerize to form vitamin D, or it's also called cholecalciferol, as shown here. Then in the liver, there's a hydroxyl group added at the 25 position, and in the kidney, a hydroxyl group added to the one position to form this fully activated 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is also called calcitriol because it has a total of three hydroxyl groups or triol. So we know that parathyroid hormone is involved in this process. How does that happen? It activates the second hydroxylation step in the kidney. 
just like all other hormones, activated vitamin D must also be inactivated. How does that happen? So it gets further metabolized by another hydroxylase and adding a hydroxyl group on this 24 position inactivates the hormone. Vitamin D binds to a nuclear hormone receptor. So the vitamin D receptor is itself a transcription factor as shown in this image. So here we have vitamin D, the active form, bound to the vitamin D receptor of protein, and it can enter the nucleus and heterodimerizes with another protein called the retinoic acid receptor. And together they bind to uh, vitamin D response elements in the genome and then recruit a bunch of other proteins that can result either in activation of gene transcription or gene repression, depending on the cell and the other cell signaling events going on in the cell at that time. So we know that there's greater than 2,000 positions in the human genome that are occupied by the vitamin D receptor, and there's greater than 200 genes whose transcription significantly changes in response to vitamin D. And we know that almost all human cells express the vitamin D receptor. So putting all that together, what does this tell us? So to me, it says that the simplified um, model I'll be showing you for what vitamin D does for calcium homeostasis is far from complete. There's a lot more to know about vitamin D, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what we learn in the future, but we won't go there in the rest of this, this lecture. All right, so what do we know about vitamin D and calcium homeostasis? I think the biggest, uh, the largest effect is on the absorption of calcium in the intestine. So vitamin D activates genes involved in absorbing more calcium. So that's probably the, the biggest effect on uh, increasing the blood or serum levels of calcium in the body. Parathyroid hormones also involved here. And if we recall, parathyroid hormone um, has several direct effects on calcium homeostasis, such as bone resorption and reabsorption of calcium from the kidney filtrate, so it's not released into the urine, as well as increasing phosphate excretion into the urine. Because remember that phosphate binds tightly to calcium. And when there's reduced phosphate in the serum, then there is more free calcium. Parathyroid hormone also acts indirectly by activating vitamin D. So remember that the um, hydroxylation on the one position of vitamin D is activated by parathyroid hormone. And that therefore parathyroid hormone indirectly acts at all these places as well, all these mechanisms. So vitamin D deficiency is a frequent cause of secondary hyperparathyroidism. Why is that? What might be the mechanism for that? I think the easiest way to think about that is to remember that there's negative feedback regulation of serum calcium on parathyroid hormone secretion, as shown in this image here. So here the red circles are calcium, the blue triangles are parathyroid hormone. When there's high levels of calcium in the blood, the red circles, that inhibits release a parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid gland. Alternatively, if there's relatively low levels of calcium in the blood, so not much of the red dot here, then that releases the negative feedback inhibition and lots of parathyroid hormone is released. So that would be secondary hyperparathyroidism, right? And so if there is vitamin D deficiency, there's going to be less calcium absorbed in the intestine, relatively lower levels of calcium in the blood, and higher levels of parathyroid hormone required to maintain calcium homeostasis. I think it's important to remember for bone health that our skeleton serves as a calcium reserve, and the body will sacrifice the structural function of bone to maintain 
blood and cell concentrations, both calcium and phosphorus. So we'll break down our bones to release that calcium and phosphorus that we need to maintain the serum and cellular levels of, of calcium needed for so many functions in the body. And that's why we have a relatively high lifetime risk for fractures due to osteoporosis. So for women, it's about one in every two women in the United States. For men, it's about one in every five to eight. Uh, and this graph shows us how uh, with age, our bone mass or bone density changes. And so we, we reach our peak level of bone mass, bone density in the late 20s and early 30s. After that, we see a decrease. Women do not typically achieve the same level as men do. And during menopause, when there's a sharp decrease in the amount of estrogen, uh, the bone mineral density uh, steeply declines. That puts women at high risk for having a low enough bone, bone uh, mineral density to have uh, a lot of fractures due to osteoporosis. So in order to prevent osteoporosis, the best thing we can do is have the highest possible bone mineral density uh, during young adulthood. Interestingly, while black adults consistently have lower serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, they also have higher bone mineral density and a lower risk of osteoporosis related fractures. This apparent paradox is really fascinating. It's not yet fully understood. There are lots of hypotheses and I'm just providing two references here if you're interested in some further reading about the topic. So building peak bone mass and preventing osteoporosis, want to make sure we consume adequate calcium and vitamin D throughout our lives, um, life, lifelong participation in weight bearing and muscle strengthening activities is important. Tobacco use and excessive alcohol use inhibit formation of the peak bone density. And for patients who are at risk of falls, we want to help treat those risk factors. For the dietary guidelines for calcium and vitamin D, the, the complete information is posted on the PDF on Canvas. Um, and I'll just review some of the common numbers here for recommended daily allowances. For all of us over the age of four, the recommendations are between 1,000 and 1,300 milligrams per day, less for younger children. For vitamin D, for babies, the recommendation is 400 international units, uh, and all breastfed babies should receive 400 international units daily of vitamin D supplements. For people over the age of one, the recommendations range from 600 to 800 international units currently. So based on the mechanism of vitamin D, do you think it's important to consume calcium and vitamin D within the same meal? So if we think about it, first vitamin D needs to be activated in the liver and then in the kidney, and then it binds a nuclear hormone receptor and changes gene transcription. And then that has to work through with translation and changing protein levels for it all to function. So that's a really time consuming process. So while vitamin D absolutely affects how much calcium we absorb in our diet, the, um, they do not need to be consumed together. Um, uh, just because of the timing of, of how vitamin D functions. Okay, so to summarize, activated vitamin D clearly increases intestinal calcium absorption, has effect on bone and kidney, and may have many other effects throughout the body that are not yet fully understood. We know that peak bone density occurs by the age of 30 to 35 years old, and osteoporosis prevention begins by providing sufficient calcium, vitamin D, and weight-bearing exercises to reach peak bone density, as well as avoiding tobacco use and excessive alcohol consumption. And uh, finally, insufficient vitamin D causes bone softening, which is rickets in children, and osteom uh, osteomalacia in adults. And thank you very much for watching.